lot of good ideas to save you money on your taxes. I'm gonna kick it off. I'm a principal in our fixed asset services group. We do primarily four things. We do fixed asset planning, construction tax planning, cost segregation, and energy incentives. And all four of those items we're gonna to touch upon today. Also got Lyle Henney. He's from the Minneapolis office, specializing in R&D tax incentives. And then winding us down will be Joe Sawatsky, Fixed Asset Services Manager, Senior Manager. He'll be talking a little bit about Section 179D and some other energy incentives. So let's dig in. All right, we're gonna start with fixed asset planning. So a lot of words here, but uh, I'll focus on the bold. Fixed asset planning is an excellent way to comply with current tax law while identifying deductions that maximize cash flow and reduce income tax liability. So in essence, it's looking at your fixed assets and finding ways we can accelerate deductions on the tax side. Where you find these opportunities are primarily in your building in your building improvement, and sometimes in your land improvement assets as well. Those things that are traditionally in a longer life tax bracket can be reduced significantly through uh, a couple means that we'll go through. Uh, we use engineering techniques, some of those using cost segregation, to split out a building and the building improvement assets into their buckets. So let's dig right into why we do this. So it's really a no-brainer. Fixed asset planning assesses the current and future fixed asset ledger environment. It does three really nice things for you. It reduces your tax liability, significant cash flow, and a positive net present value. Your net present value, your ratio from doing the project to how much it costs to do the project is always a 10 to one or greater number. So it's really one of those last no-brainer services in the tax world. And it also sets up the framework for future tax savings. So when can we do it? So fixed asset planning is extremely flexible and it has been around since the mid-90s in its modern form. So it's a very low-risk way to find deductions if you need them in the current year. We can go back in time you go back as far back as 1987, really, but realistically going back to about 2000, look at your building and building improvement portfolio and file a form 3115. It's an automatic method change. You do not need IRS consent and it gives you a nice to catch up deduction in year one. The easiest way to do it though is just keep on it year in and year out in the current tax year find those building and building improvement items and look for deductions. That just goes seamlessly onto your 4562 and you get into a good practice of maximizing deductions. And then later on, we're gonna talk a little bit about construction in progress. Besides being reactive and doing some study, looking for deductions after the building is built or the building is acquired, you can be proactive and set up a system to capture those deductions early and often. So how do we do it? So looking at your historical tax fixed asset ledger, we have a plenty of tools in our tool belt to capture these deductions and Congress keeps on enacting laws to allow us to do even more. So right now we live in a world of 100% bonus, so there's recovery periods. Uh, for example, an HVAC unit that is in your computer room that's calling solely your computer or servers can be a five-year asset or traditionally in building your financial books is put as a building asset. So easy grabs like that are plentiful. Section 179, we're going to talk a little bit about repair and maintenance. This came out in 2014. Book, financial book, I should say, traditionally overcapitalizes building and building assets. On the tax side of the house, just because financial books is calling one thing a building or it's coded that way, does not mean it needs to be capitalized at a 39-year life for tax. 
repair and maintenance finds these items, typically roofs, HVAC replacements, flooring, coatings, and a whole host of other items. If we cannot get an asset fully into a shorter life, then we start splitting the baby in two. We do some cost segregation where we can get 10, 20, 30% of a single building asset into a shorter life. Um, and at that time, we could also look at partial dispositions. We see this a lot with renovations and remodels where uh, there'll be a certain number of removal costs and disposal costs going in to that renovation that could capture back in time the original building was placed to service. And then energy incentives, which we'll get to a little later on in the presentation. So a lot there, a lot of ways to get your 39 year or 27 and a half year asset to zero or short of that a five or seven year bonus bucket. So holistically looking at a building traditionally in the, in the tax world, taxpayers are very good at capturing deductions when something's first built. So you're looking at a graph here, zero, five, 15, 30 years of a building and the green portion is kind of a sweet spot. What gets overlooked a lot is from the five to 30 year. So five to 15 is when you start doing some refreshes. That's when your roof replacements come in or you're doing something um, to your dealership because to change branding or to your retail store to change branding. Those items are often, they seem small compared to the overall building but the benefits that are hiding out there are significant because there's a lot to do other than cost segregation in that space, particularly from 15 to 30 years when you get into that more major renovation. And then eventually uh, the whole life cycle of building, either you go and buy a new one or you do a gut rehab. So all these quadrants need to be looked at and thought about even at the inception of buying or uh, building a new facility. So the big thing with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, was, particularly in the depreciation world, was bonus. So bonus is now available for used property. It was always available for new construction, self-constructed assets. Now we can do it for purchases. You purchase something after September 27th, 2017, you're going to get a 100% bonus on qualified property. It's very possible that you've been doing cost segregation on your acquisitions even without bonus because the value prop is there, but now you have an extra incentive to capture that deduction. Look how that's going to play out in the near future. Next five years, we have a 100% bonus, so we need to take advantage of that and get as much qualified property possible out of our building and building improvements. It scales down 80, 60, 40, 20. To put it in perspective, we're at, we were at 50 in 2017. So not until 2025 do we actually dip below that 50 mark. And who knows what's going to happen um, with elections and leadership and Congress and laws that aren't enacting. So we'll see if that bonus continues mm -hmm. thereafter. So I keep on talking about qualified property. You can't just build something and throw it into bonus. You ha have to be qualified. It's not an all or nothing thing. Um, so here is uh, some requirements to be eligible for it. The qualified property is recovery period of 20 years or less. So if you have a 39 year building, it's in your best interest to do a cost segregation and find as much five and seven years as possible, carve it out, get it, to that under 20 bracket and bonus it out. You gotta meet the placement service requirements which we looked at. And again, I can't stress this enough. If you buy something or acquire something that has a good chance of getting into that bonus bracket. So you gotta look into it. Looking at a couple success stories, I mean, we got two manufacturing ones right here. Something at 44,000 square feet where we did a cost segregation and a 179D 
and looking at bonus. So we took a lot of our tools in our tool belt and came up with a value prop and eventually executed on a project. About a $4 million purchase price or construction price. We got 25% of it into a qualified property, which accelerated the deduction in year one. And really, um, for a fee of $20,000. So you're getting a lot for a little uh, in this space. Looking at an acquired hydraulic cylinder manufacturing facility, this was one where it did not qualify for bonus. However, even without that bonus, you're still accelerating into a shorter life recovery period and garnering $700,000 in savings. So bonus is not a make or break thing, it's just a very, very nice to have. But whenever you are building or acquiring or renovating, it's always good to ask yourself, how can I get the biggest possible deduction? So we're gonna talk a little bit about construction tax planning. I would say 90 to 95% of our work in the fixed asset space happens after the building's been acquired or after the building's been constructed. It's a very reactive process and that's okay because there's a lot of documentation out there that allows us to justify good deductions. However, if you are one to be more proactive and you know you want the deduction and you know you're about to build a building or acquire a building, then some construction tax planning is warranted. It really bridges the gap between the construction process and the accounting process. So we talk to the general contractor, we talk to the architect. There's many things that are considered during a construction project, design, functionality, uh, tax is not one of them, and it should be, because it has significant uh, savings are embedded in some of these construction costs, and the way you handle the materials or use the materials comes into play. And that's where this slide is digging into segregation of assets. Of course, componentizing the building in such a way and such a framework so you can realize deductions throughout the whole life cycle of the building. Advising on material choices and installation methods. We sometimes do this monthly with the general contractor, uh, asking them to break out certain divisions of construction or asking them, hey, can we change the material type or the installation method to take advantage of deductions? And oftentimes the increases from being proactive to reactive are substantial. The four stages of construction tax planning, we assess as early as possible. Really, we'd love to be there in the design stage to chart a customized course. We've done it halfway through. We've done it a couple months before building opening. But getting there as early as possible is helpful. And then we could set up a plan on how or when and how often we advise. Typically, it's a monthly uh, item. As it comes in, we're able to analyze in real time. So if you need projections on your taxable income, we can tell you real time what that's gonna look like and where the deduction is heading. Then of course, it's one thing to get a wonderful deduction, but how do you integrate it into your systems? And we are versed in that as well to help through the fixed asset software integrations. Setting it up in such a way so it's meaningful, you lay the foundation for future tax savings. Let me say this, fixed asset plan should happen annually. Sometimes I see it happen quarterly, where you look through your additions for the year and try to mine for deductions. Uh, when construction tax plans should happen, are those who taxpayers who want to plan ahead are a little bit more proactive? Um, general contractors, you see a lot of that in this space, or developers with multiple investors. And typically, it's a construction period of one year or greater. It doesn't have to be. This is my last slide. To sum up fixed asset services, uh, I can't stress this enough. Everyone should do a, an assessment. This is something that is free, and it's always good to know what's out there. So if you have income and you're in the mood for deduction, let's do an assessment. If you're just coming out of net operating losses and really didn't care about this before, and now all of a sudden you do, let's talk. 
if you haven't really looked at your fixed asset through this lens over the last, let's say, three years, then let's talk about that and we'll look at all possible areas to get that 39 year, that 27 and a half year to a shorter life, get you that deduction a lot sooner so you don't have to wait so long. Something that's free, why is it free? Because traditionally taxpayers overcapitalize and we know we could help them in that space pretty easily. Okay, first polling question for CPE credit. For those who are multitasking, let's look at the screen now. Choose A, B, or C. The question is, when was the last time you assessed your fixed assets for tax saving opportunities? All right, so you got three choices. First, we don't pay too much attention to this. Not a priority for us right now. B, we review at a high level, but we should get better into a better rhythm of knowing what is available to us. Or C, we are fairly diligent on assessing large opportunities, but could be better overall. So I'll give you a little time to fill that out, make sure we get all the responses in. You're probably wondering why isn't there a letter D, we're good, we have everything. And I thought of putting that in there, but really at the end of the day, nine times out of 10, there's gonna be some overcapitalization. And so really, always worth taking a peek uh, through an assessment. So the winner, we are fairly diligent, but could be better overall. So those are probably the uh, people who are really good in that green bucket when something's built or something's acquired, but maybe could look at holistically what's going on with renovations, remodels, and improvements. And then we got about 60% who uh, might need a, an assessment in the next uh, this next tax year, see what's going on. Okay, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Lyle, and he's going to talk a little bit about research and development. Thank you, Mark. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about the R&D tax credit. Give you a little objectives. Uh, we're going to do an introduction of what the R&D tax incentive is, uh, how to qualify for it, what some qualified costs are, uh, some recent developments and credit enhancements that have happened lately documentation considerations, and then what we're seeing in trends from the IRS or state audit. So the R&D tax credit has been around since the early 80s. It is designed to incentivize companies to be innovative and to hopefully keep jobs here in the U.S. It's a nice federal credit, uh, typically results in about 5 to 8% of any eligible expenses that we see come back as a credit. And it is a credit, which means basically it gets applied to any taxes that are owed. Um, you still get to deduct all the expenses as normal, uh, usual expenses as you normally would, but then you kind of get, get the double dip and you get this 5 to 8% back as an additional credit to reduce your taxes. There are also state credits. Um, not every state has one, but a large majority of them do. And even some of those exceed the federal credit. Um, so they're also good to look at. The nice thing is it is a permanent tax benefit now uh, going forward. Uh, so you can plan on it. And we can evaluate uh, what we call all open years, which is typically the current year plus three prior years are considered open tax years yet. So you can go back and amend tax returns and claim the credit. So what, uh, what are some of the qualification and criteria? Basically, it focuses around what is called a new or improved business component. And a business component is product, it can be processes, it can be software, it can be techniques, formulations, or inventions. And the IRS basically has what they call a four-part test to define what is R&D, because most of the time when we meet with clients, they're like, we don't do R&D, we, you know, we don't have a lab, we don't have white lab coats, we don't have butts and burners. But the IRS definition is much broader than that uh, thinking. And so what the tests say, first of all, is that the research is for a permitted purpose, which is developing that new or improved product or process or software, just uh, like we talked about the business component. Uh, the second test is that there's uncertainty at the outset of the project. Uncertainty means everything from chance of failure, which I tell my clients, if they have failures, bring them out of the dark corner, let's celebrate them a little bit, take advantage of them. 
But typically the answer we get most of the time is we know we can do it. We just don't know how we're going to do it at the outset of the project. So we may not know the exact uh, design, the exact materials, the exact process to get to our end solution. Which leads to the third test then is that there's a process of experimentation, which simply means we're looking at two or more alternatives to relieve that uncertainty. So again, it could be two or more designs, two or more materials, two or more processes. And the IRS likes to use, uh, you know, you got option A and option B. In reality, it is more option A, 8.1, 8.2. It is an iterative uh, process, uh, going through experimentation, making modifications, so forth, that qualify. And then finally, the fourth test is that the research is technological in nature, which simply means research relies upon principles of hard science, such as engineering, uh, physics, biology, computer science, keep naming sciences. Uh, what they're ruling out is what they call business or soft science. So marketing, accounting, business administrative activities do not qualify. As long as the business component meets those four tests, it is a qualified activity. So in the you know, contracting, engineering, architectural worlds, uh, some of the things we look for are constructability analysis. You, know, you might evaluate different design alternatives, uh, geotechnical solutions, designs, integration of technology into solutions, uh, design of systems, subsystems with newer different functionality. You could be uh, analyzing alternative construction materials. You could be looking at remediation solution designs. Uh, newer improved construction technique evaluation, uh, looking at sustainable architecture, green concepts, uh, value engineering is a big one, um, you know, where you're looking for alternatives to re reduce the cost, uh, but still provide a quality product. So in the construction, architectural, engineering world, uh, one of the things we need to look at is funded research. Uh, that's one of the biggest exclusions. And by what funded research, basically what we're looking for is how are you paid uh, for the work that you are doing? If you're being paid time and materials for the work, basically you're re being reimbursed for all your time. There, the IRS says there's no economic risk to you and therefore it would not qualify uh, for the R&D credit. If you're being paid on a fixed fee basis, you quote, you know, you quote them a fee. That is not considered funded research because the economic risk would be to you, to you. There's no guarantee that you're gonna be successful in doing the design. There's no uh, guarantee that you're gonna do it in the fee uh, quote that you claimed and so forth. So uh, that is what is funded research. Uh, so time and materials, uh, no, no economic risk, fixed fee, economic risk, qualifies. The other thing we need to look at is what's called rights and risks analysis. And with rights and risk, it's not exclusive between you and your client. It could be shared rights and risks, but basically you need to have some rights and risks to the R&D analysis, uh, whatever you're doing. Uh, there needs to be some rights to maintain that, to use it, uh, so forth. It's not uh, solely your client's property. That is what we're looking for also to make sure we can qualify. There's a couple court cases out there, uh, the Geosyntec and the Dianetics case, uh, basically you know, identify that fixed fee is, or lump sum contracts are the only thing that the IRS is really going to allow. If it's uh, time and materials or a cost plus, they say no, it's, that doesn't qualify. So who, who, who's a good uh, profile? candidate for this. Um, it's anybody who employs technical personnel, you know, engineers, designers, architects, or anybody who's filling that role. It could be project managers, superintendents also. It's a firm that's profitable. As I said, it offsets the taxes uh, that is generated and it does carry forward uh, up to, you know, uh, several many years. But the key is, you know, being able to utilize it soon. So you're either profitable now or you will be shortly. Uh, startup companies are also good candidates, even if they're not profitable, because uh, there are uh, some new incentives for them to be able to utilize it. And basically, a company that has a high percentage of fixed price work. Um, again, different types of uh, companies that qualify, engineering, architectural, general contractors, mechanical contractors, electrical, uh, fabrication, they all potentially have qualified R&D activities. 
So what are those costs that we get to look at uh, for the calculation? There's three basic costs. Wages are typically the largest uh, for most of our clients. Uh, wages, basically what we're looking for are those individuals who are doing the direct R&D. So your engineers, your designers, uh, people like that who are doing, doing the direct R&D. Uh, you can also have direct supervision uh, included in there. So uh, if the CEO of the firm uh, is giving direction to the engineering team or the design team as to what, what they should be working on and how they should be uh, doing some stuff, we can take a per portion of their time potentially. You can also have direct support uh, members of the team. Those would be people, uh, potentially the construction people who are building prototypes, uh, proving out designs, things of that nature. And basically what we look at is try to uh, come up with what percentage of an individual's time is qualified R&D, and then we're gonna take that of their W-2 box one wages. Supplies, uh, mater those are materials that are used in the process of R&D, such as prototypes. Uh, if you're, again, if you're developing uh, first time something, uh, you're mocking it up, whatever it is, materials that go into that uh, would be an example of uh, supply costs that we can claim. And then the third are contract research costs. If you're using an outside firm to help you with the R&D uh, or an outside individual, um, Basically, they're not an employee of your firm. Again, as long as the firm has the economic risk and not your contractor, um, they have rights and risks to whatever the contractor is doing, that, then we can probably qualify them also in the R&D tax credit. So some recent development, uh, the federal R&D credit was made permanent back in 2015. Uh, 1981 up till 2015, it had been temporary. They basically expired uh, every couple of years and they, we had to wait for Congress to renew it. So that's great. Uh, companies uh, can have more certainty about using it, planning on it, um, because unfortunately they would, they would a lot of time let it expire and it would be not until December of the year before they re renew it. So you never knew if you were gonna be able to claim it or not and whether you should be keeping track of what's going on and so forth. Um, there was also uh, several credit enhancements extent, uh, as part of the extension. One of those um, was that prior to the law change, uh, R&D credits could not offset AMT tax. They could only be offset regular tax. So a lot of pass-through companies uh, fell into that alternative minimum tax and they would not be able to utilize the credit. They could claim it, but it would end up being a carry forward. Um, now, uh, if you are an eligible small business, meaning you are less than $50 million in gross receipts average over the three prior years, you can offset your AMT starting in 2016 and forward. So it's a big impact, like I said, for pass-through entities. As far as like documentation, uh, a lot of companies are kind of like, well, we don't document, we don't have a lot of documentation. Basically, there are no specific record keeping requirements that the IRS has spelled out. So basically what we're looking for is, you know, if you have time tracking systems, awesome. Uh, IRS loves that. But in reality, the majority of our clients do not have a time tracking system. We're gonna use some form of estimation and then back it up with contemporaneous documentation. And by contemporaneous documentation, what I'm talking about is, uh, are there emails, are there meeting minutes, are there drawings, are there whatever uh, that are created at the time the R&D was occurring that we can use and tie back to individuals, tie back to projects and say, okay, here's, here's documents that help support the four-part four test argument and here's why it is qualified R&D. The IRS can be aggressive. Right now, in all honesty, you know, what we see is we probably see annually about half a percent of our clients, half to one percent of our clients get an IRS audit. Uh, it's very low. And even those that do, we have very successful uh, retention rates of the credits for them. I'd say it's not, a, uh, from a federal standpoint, uh, the IRS is not an automatic audit. Uh, I know a lot of a lot of clients uh, think this is gonna be a red flag, not, not the case. But basically we wanna 
retain and uh, collect documentation that uh, you guys created while the R&D was happening. Uh, so kind of tie back with those IRS state audit trends. Um, large case audit agents, they're generally educated, they understand the R&D, they're very, very good to work with. Small business exams are a little more agent driven. They're not as well educated about the R&D credit. So a lot of our job is uh, if we ever get into an audit, and that's a big if, uh, is educating the agent along the way and you know, demonstrating, again, why a company qualifies and why these activities meet the test. They become a little more focused, uh, but at the same time, like I said, we've seen very li limited low percentages. The states tend to be a little more aggressive on uh, R&D audits. We see a little higher percentage with these states. Again, though, we've had very good luck at retaining the credits. Basically, what we see with certain states is when the state is in a budget deficit, we see a little more audits. Uh, when they're in a surplus, then we not as many. So, so a couple quick case studies before I turn it over to Joe. Uh, mechanical contractor, they had revenue of $20 million. Uh, we looked at the constructability issues, value engineering, mechanical design services. It was a one-year study, but we identified $600,000 worth of qualified expenses for them. And combined, they got about $60,000 in uh, federal and state credits. Uh, another one was an engineering firm, a uh, wide array of uh, projects, but revenue of about $4 million, several large design consulting projects. Uh, they work in pre-construction phase, including structural design, construction, engineering, et cetera. Again, one year, they had about $1.3 million with qualified expenses and about $173,000 combined federal and state credits. So nice little returns for them. So polling question number two, the analysis of alternative construction material is considered an activity that typically qualifies for R&D tax credit. True or false? Okay, appreciate it. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Swatsky. Take it away, Joe. Fanta fantastic, Lyle, thanks so much. And thanks so much, all of you, for spending a little time with us here today. We're gonna to spend the next 25 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes, talking about energy incentives. And so what we'll be doing is we'll talk, have a brief overview and history of two programs, specifically the 179D and 45L program. And then we'll take a look at the outlook for the future. If we look at the energy consumption in the United States, it's just under 100 quadrillion to use, which is a lot. And so in an effort to lower that overall energy consumption, the Department of Energy and the IRS uh, created programs to incentivize uh, green building practices. And the one we're gonna talk about first is Section 179D, also commonly referred to as BPACT. And this 179D was uh, first enacted in uh, 2005, and it was extended to, through 2013. 2017. We're going to talk a little bit about on the privately owned side uh, projects, Form 3115, to take advantage of those uh, retro projects, as well as for governmental entities. Uh, projects. We'll look at how the designers can also take advantage of, of the deduction. So a brief overview of history. Lyle mentioned earlier that uh, on the R&D side, that was one of those situations where they would expire and continually renew. 179D and 45L are currently in that same, uh, kind of on that same tack, whereby uh, they have undergone seven expirations and re-ups uh, since 2005. And there are extensions pending for 2018 into 19. And so right now we're going to be focusing on uh, projects placed in service prior to January 1st, 2018. The good news is there's still a number of opportunities out there. And if we understand them, then we'll be in a good spot. But it will eight, uh, an eighth renewal for 45L 179D. So for 179D, how do we, what are the qualification requirements? We must show an energy use of less than or 50% or more energy efficiency of 50% or more over a reference building uh, as noted by the ASHRAE 90.1 standard. And so you've got a couple options there. 
you can either go case by case for each of the three building components, envelope, mechanical, or lighting, each worth 50 cents a piece for a total of $1.80. Or you can take a look at something called the whole building approach, whereby one building component might drive down the energy consumption of a building such that it meets that overall 50% energy threshold, and then you're entitled to that full dollar eighty. So as an example, if one were to go through and do a major HVAC upgrade, for instance, on an existing building, and the HVAC that was installed was such that now our overall energy efficiency is greater than 50%, even though we haven't touched the envelope and we haven't touched the interior lighting, we are still qualified for that full dollar eighty uh, per square foot. If it doesn't happen, then we'll look at the uh, partial qualifications on a per uh, on a on a on a per component basis. I won't dig into the details here, but just know that there it's a sliding scale depending on when the projects were placed in service, and there are different requirements for different building components. So, okay, how do we prove this 50% energy efficiency? The first thing we need to do is take a look at the blueprints and the specifications, and then we're going to create an energy model using Department of Energy and IRS approved software. Every single project needs a site visit to verify that the energy efficient building uh, property is installed. And then finally, that uh, that model or that certificate needs to be certified by a qualified individual, typically a licensed engineer or contractor in the jurisdiction of the uh, of the building. So obviously some positive uh, factors, and I just want to draw your attention to the LED lighting at the at the bottom there. Uh, with all of the advances in LED technology over the last 10, 15 years, the energy consumption, the energy savings on LED lights are just off the charts. And so anytime we see a project or a potential project with LEDs, that's uh, a real a real strong possibility that there may be benefit there. Conversely, just to touch on the negative factors, I just want to caution folks to not pre-disqualify yourself out of the gate. If you're in the mood for the deductions and, and, and are looking to uh, possibly save some tax dollars and you've built, built or renovated a building, I would encourage you to not say, well, you know what, we didn't put in uh, the highest efficient HVAC and we didn't put in LED, so it's probably not worth pursuing. Uh, it's typically worth running the numbers and just seeing where the models come out. And then from there, it's just kind of a business case. Does this make sense in our in our tax planning picture? So that's how we that those are the mechanics of actually uh, demonstrating a building any any, any building uh, meets the energy efficient requirements. And so now we're going to talk about how that pertains to the folks that actually own these buildings. The good news it's a quite easy to claim the deduction. It's a single line entry on the other deduction forms, typically 1120 or 1120S, and this is for current year projects. On look back studies or projects placed in service in prior years, again, going all the way back to 2006, an additional form, similar to Mark mentioned, the 3115 uh, automatic change, uh, accounting method change form is also required for 179D, as well as a form of section one, or I'm sorry, section 481A adjustment to true up the depreciation schedule going forward. So here are a couple quick case studies we can look at on the privately owned side. Uh, here was a distribution center. Let's look at the specifications there. So in this case, uh, we're fortunate enough the entire 116,000 foot building qualified for the full dollar 80 using the whole building approach. It yielded about a $209,000 deduction which in turn, looking at about an $83,000 first year benefit uh, for the owners. In a similar vein, heavy equipment dealership, with slightly larger building, about 150,000 square feet, yielded a deduction of about $269,000. So not bad. Ah, here we go. So here we are, polling question number three. What is the deduction amount allowed per square foot in section 179D for HVAC, building envelope, and lighting products? Fantastic, yeah, that's absolutely right. A dollar 80 per square foot is the total amount using the whole building approach. Great, okay. 
So we talked about how owners of buildings, energy efficient buildings can take advantage, but what about governmental buildings, right? There are hundreds of thousands of federally owned buildings along, along the lines and along with state, local, school districts, things of that nature. There's a, there are many, many governmental buildings who really can't use a dollar eighty per square foot, uh, dollar per eighty per square foot deduction. So how do we incentivize building energy efficient building practices that way? So in this case, what happens is the governmental entity has the ability to assign the deduction to the quote unquote designer of the energy efficient property. And current year projects are very similar to on the privately owned side, it's just in the other deductions or entered in the other deductions uh, uh, section of the return. For prior years, amended returns is required. And the other big difference here is an allocation letter is always, always required. And so let's take a little bit closer look at this allocation letter. So this allocation letter is signed by an authorized representative of the government entity, which allocates the deduction to the potential designers. And you'll see different layouts of this form, but the information uh, contained needs to be uniform. It's very, very straightforward as to the type or the amount and type of information that needs to be on there. And then the signature of the designer as well as the authorized uh, representative are also on the, uh, on the form. So let's take a quick look because this is a question that comes up quite often. We talk about uh, the governmental entities being able to assign the deduction to the designer. And so often you'll hear, well, I'm not really the architect of record on this project. Um, so I'm probably not the designer. And so I'll kind of point your attention to that second paragraph there. And that's coming right out of the Internal Revenue Bulletin, I believe it's 2008-40, Section 3.02, it kind of outlines the definition of designer, right? And so a designer could obviously be an architect, could be an engineer, could be a consultant, could be a general contractor. It could be really anybody who creates the technical specifications for the energy efficient building property, right? And so it could be that there are uh, more than one, and more often than not, there are more than one um, uh, potential designers on any one project. So it's important to, to understand, and, and what we don't see here is if we read on in that definition, it goes along the lines, say something along the lines of the individual that merely installs, maintains, repairs the property is not necessarily the designer. So in order to um, confidently go after this 179D deduction as a designer of governmental properties, it's really important that we, that we feel good about we played a role in the, uh, in the design process of the, uh, of the specifications. We can run through a couple quick case studies here on the governmental side. Here's a small fine arts center, again, a full dollar 80 per square foot deduction, which yielded the $143,000 $143, deduction for the designer. Here's another, this is a smaller elementary school, rural and elementary school that underwent a renovation. Uh, same deal using the full building approach, the whole building approach rather. The designer on this project was entitled to the $74,633 deduction. Here are some additional examples. And where it kind of gets fun on the governmental side is 179D has the ability or has the potential to be a pretty powerful tax planning tool. And so whereby, you know, as you kind of forecast out your tax liability for the next year or, or, or multiple years, you can have the opportunity to kind of fold in 179D and say, all right, here are the projects that we are the designers on. Here are the projects that we can uh, receive, that we feel good about receiving the allocation letters on. And, you know, let's kind of do the math and see what, see what uh, amount of income we should shelter. And in this particular example, it looked like there was about $1.1 million of total deduction, which had a 42% marginal rate, you know, just under a half a million dollars of, of tax savings uh, for the designer in this, in this case. So it's really a nice deal. Here are some frequently asked questions that I receive uh, quite often. Parking garages are eligible. Parking structures, open air parking structures are eligible, although you are limited to 60 cents per square foot. Uh, residential buildings, three stories or less, are ineligible for 179D and will fall under 45L, which we'll touch on briefly. 
Uh, outdoor surface parking lots, nope. Fortunately, it's only interior lighting in uh, controlled space. And nonprofits cannot allocate the deduction to the designer. It needs to be from a governmental entity. So the incentive, 179D incentive as a whole, uh, encompasses privately owned for-profit buildings as well as governmental owned buildings, but that nonprofit sector is kind of lost in the mix. Hopefully at some point they'll get that fixed. Some key takeaways again, up to $1.80 a square foot for privately owned buildings. You can go all the way back to 2006. On the governmental side, you are limited to an open tax year because amended returns are required. And because it's a per square foot deduction, the bigger, the better. And that brings us to our final polling question, polling question number four. Have you constructed an apartment building three stories or less in the last three years? All right, looks like we've got one out there. That's great. And so that polling question is a great lead in to the final topic of this afternoon's talk on 45L. Now 45L is an energy incentive for residential real estate three stories or less. We encompass apartment buildings, townhomes, even single family houses. Now dissimilar to 179D where that's a dollar eighty per square foot deduction, 45L is a two thousand dollar per qualifying unit credit. Credit, not deduction. So it has the opportunity or has the potential to add up quickly. Let's see if I can Move the slide ahead here. There we go. And so I won't bore you with the gory details on the uh, qualification requirements for 45L, but just understand that they're very, very similar to 179D in that you, are, you have to demonstrate an energy efficiency of 50% or greater over a reference building. In this case, it's based off the 2006 IE. IECC standard as opposed to ASHRAE 90.1. And one slight provision in there is of that 50%, uh, a fifth of that needs to come from the, the building envelope itself. And so from a, from a practical level, 45L is slightly more challenging to qualify for uh, than 179D, but there's still a number of opportunities out there. Again, you, the, the more energy efficient the better and because what we'll be doing when we model these 45l projects through the uh, approved software it's, it's kind of a big formula right and so it may be that the uh, the windows for instance maybe aren't that energy efficient but the hvac and the insulation the r value of the walls might make up for that and so it's just kind of a situation where you need to run the numbers and see what makes sense quick case study here uh, 56 unit townhome complex. You can see the stats below. 110, I'm sorry, 100% of the units passed, earned the owner $112,000 in credits. So some, t uh, some key takeaways on the 45L program. Again, it's a $2,000 credit per qualifying unit. Privately owned, three story, or less residential structure must be substantially complete prior to 2000 in January 1st, 2018. And in the same vein where bigger is better for 179D because it's on a per square foot basis, uh, bigger is better here because it's uh, based on a $2,000 per unit uh, credit. And so in order to create a provisional analysis, we take a look at the plans and specs and figure out the likelihood of qualification. So we mentioned at the outset that uh, this is program, or both of these programs are currently in, uh, in a state of expiration or waiting for the next uh, re-up, which we expect here shortly. In a perfect world, we'd have the Clean Energy Act for America come through. And there you can see some of the uh, benefits for both 179D and 45L. But I think at this point in the game, probably our best bet and kind of what we internally are, are kind of making our plans around is a, a bipartisan tax bill that was introduced by uh, Chuck Grassley of Iowa 
as well as Ron Biden of Oregon. And I was introduced on February 28th of this year, so a month and a half ago. And what that will do, um, if and when it does pass, is it will extend 179D and 45L through 18 and through 19 with an eye towards making uh, these two programs permanent, similar to R&D. And that will certainly make planning uh, going forward much, much easier. Um, so as we speak, it's kind of winding its way through Congress and the House is holding meetings on these as well as other tax extenders. And we're hoping cautiously optimistic for some movement in the near future. So with that, I think we'll probably open it up for questions, huh, Amy? Sounds good. So if you do have a question, please use the Q&A box located on your menu bar, or you can use the chat feature. If you have more of a personal question that needs um, assistance, you can always email our presenters um, and they will get back to you. Also keep in mind that here is a list of all of our upcoming webinars for May and you can register for those visiting our website. Joe and Lyle, there are no questions coming in, so it is up to you what you'd like to do. Well, it sounds like we nailed it. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> well, that's great. I'd just like to say that thanks, thanks again to everybody involved for uh, taking an hour out of their day to join us. And uh, well, if you're looking out the window, spring has sprung here, finally. So hopefully we can take advantage of that soon. Yep, as Amy said, if there's any questions, uh, contact information, feel free to reach out to us. Awesome. Thank you all so much and have a great day. Mm -hmm.